Uh, but it is worth noting that one person thanked in the footnotes by Michael Klausner and Michael Olrogi is a man named John Coates. Welcome to Compliance into the Weeds. In this episode, Tom and Matt take a deep dive into several issues regarding SPACs. We take a look at the ubiquitousness of SPAC filings, what has driven the dramatic increase in M&A activity, corporate governance issues with SPACs, internal controls issues with SPACs, what has or will the Delaware Supreme Court say about governing law, and where will the SEC come down on SPACs? Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, back again with Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. This is our post-Thanksgiving episode. So, Matt, uh, welcome back, and I hope you survive the holiday. Uh, We did. It was a usually cold Thanksgiving in Boston, right around freezing, but... uh, Took us four days, but we burned through all the turkey and all the leftovers, and we're ready to get back into the thick of things here. So we finished uh, the last of our leftovers last night for dinner. So I told my wife, "Great job! We uh, had one meal that lasted for four days." Excellent. Uh, so Matt, you wrote about uh, SPACs this week and SPACs and conflicts of interest, and I recall that we have touched upon this topic in an earlier podcast, but this blog post really focused on some research that uh, not just speculates about potential red flags or conflicts of interest, but actually demonstrates them. You want to tell us about the paper and what caught your attention? Yeah, sure. So there were two pieces of guidance or research that came out recently relating to SPACs that I think are interconnected. And the first was this research paper published on November 18 by two men, Michael Klausner, of Stanford Law School and Michael Olrogi of New York University Law School. And they basically were pointing out that there is an inherent conflict of interest between SPAC sponsors, who are really the management team, SPAC sponsors and the board versus SPAC shareholders. That uh, SPACs, the sponsors and the board are always going to have an incentive to recommend to shareholders that you should approve this proposed merger we have so that we can take a private company public and we can de-SPAC, which is the process that happens here. Uh, and then we go from being a blank check company to a happy and proud brand new public operating company. That's what SPACs do. The sponsors put everything together. They put to find the private company target. They raise the money from shareholders. The money is then held in a trust. And then when they finally do find that merger target, uh, through various means, uh, old Klausner and Olrogi basically sh- show that the sponsors are always going to have an economic incentive to tell the shareholders, you should approve this merger even if it's bad for the shareholders, because the way these mergers happen, the sponsors are always going to wind up sitting pretty on a big pile of equity worth a ton of money. So even if the merger is a bit of a stinker for shareholders, the the, uh, sponsors still have strong incentive to uh, endorse the merger idea, to recommend its approval. And so they might be tempted, therefore, to not be forthcoming about, well, actually, this merger is kind of a stinker, but we're not going to tell you that. They have that incentive. Uh, and Olrogi and Klausner specifically were calling on the Delaware Chancery Court to start reviewing these issues because they are going to come up in court. There's already a court case of unhappy SPAC shareholders. Um, but the SPAC sponsors are trying to say that this doesn't require any extra judicial review. So therefore, you can just use existing corporate law, even though that doesn't really fit with how SPACs work, and that would essentially leave shareholders with no recourse. Um, And so, Tom, I'll stop right there, that we have a lot of corporate governance issues that we could dissect. But there is, I hope we can get to, a second piece of research showing that SPACs are flooding Wall Street right now, and they are turning around some long-running trends about corporate filings to the SEC. So we have this conflicted business model 
at the same time that SPACs are growing like weeds. And you put the two of them together, you got a big mess here. So actually, uh, it was the second research paper that intrigued me the most, Matt, because um, the conflict of interest, I think, had long thought present. And now we have this research paper that would seem to indicate uh, they are present. But really what struck me is the uh, not just uptake, but significant increase in 10Q filings, which SPACs come uh uh, into the public market through. And I really wanted to to explore that phenomenon with you in terms of is uh, SPACs have been around a while, uh, so they're not new, but they've been used quite a bit. And is this a way to avoid the 18-month IPO process? Is this really something that is not new, but uh, being used uh, in a much more robust manner to help companies get public? And is it a strategy or technique that the regulators should bless? Or is this just, um, you know, kind of a dot-com bubble era uh, with a different spin? Honestly, I think uh, this is much closer to a dot-com bubble type of scenario. Uh, For those of us old enough to remember the dot-com bubble, and I was there, I was a tech reporter at the time, uh, here's what's going on. So first, we had that legal paper from Klausner and Ulrogi saying that SPACs have some very disturbing corporate governance conflicts. At the same time, by coincidence, a financial data research firm named CalcBench, based in Cambridge, where I live, uh, they were putting out a piece of research looking at the number of quarterly filings that public companies make to the SEC, 10Q filings. Now, full disclosure, I worked with CalcBench on the research note. I did not know that they were going to do this. They just kind of foisted the data on me and said, can you write up a note about this? And so I helped them write up that note and I've written up my own analysis for radical compliance. But what happened was they looked at just how many 10Q filings did the SEC receive each year for the last 10 years? So you start at 2012, and they had received somewhere in the neighborhood of 21,000 10Q filings over the course of 2012. And starting shortly thereafter in 2013, they went, I think, from 21,000 to 21,003 or so. It was a minor increase to 2013. And then the number of 10Q filings started to go down and down and down and down and down all through the 2010s to a low of only 16,900 filings in 2020. So we saw a drop in the number of 10Q filings throughout the decade, which was not a surprise because there are less companies that are trading publicly in the United States. That number has been dwindling for years, mostly because one public company is acquiring another or private equity swoops in to take a public business private and they're off the markets entirely. So 25% drop in 10Q filings over the course of the 2010s. And then we get to 2021. And what happens is suddenly we see this spike in 10Q filings over the course of this year. Uh, It has risen by more than 10% now, and the year's not yet done. So we're still going to see a couple of more filings the next couple of weeks. Uh, But now the number of 10Q filings for 2021 has risen to at least 18,675 or so. And as I said, there's going to be a couple of more trickling in. So we have this 10% increase in 10Q filings snapping this long running trend. And Tom, if you sit down and do the math, the number of companies that uh, have come on to the public markets in 2021, you know, some companies get listed, some companies delist, they vanish. There's a lot of churn. If you look at number of public filers and how that changed from 2020 to 2021. If you look at that by SIC code, which is standard industry classification. So that lets you look at how many businesses in a certain industry are coming onto the public markets or coming off. That's what CalcBench looked at. They found that by far and away, the number of public companies coming onto the market in 2021, they actually weren't companies, they were SPACs. They're holding companies. 438 more SPACs on the public markets filing 10Q reports this year than last year. 
And if you sit down and do the math, if they're a new public company, they're filing four quarterly reports, and there's 438 more SPACs this year, 438 times four is 1,752 10Q filings that now are coming to the SEC. That is more than the 10.1% increase I just mentioned. So this is a long-winded way of saying we have seen this long-running decline in the number of public filers with the SEC and the number of quarterly reports they're filing for a whole decade. And it has suddenly snapped upward. We have bent that curve in 2021, and it is entirely due to SPACs coming onto the public market, filing 10Q reports. They haven't really done much else. All a SPAC does is it goes public and then it waits around until the sponsors do a merger deal. And that hasn't happened yet for a lot of these firms. But all of this decline has suddenly stopped. It's going in the back up again, and it's all due to SPACs, which Klausner and Ulrogi have just nicely pointed out that they are a governance fire trap waiting to catch flame. And by the way, now they're flooding into the public markets in the SEC like nobody's business. And that's where we are. So now uh, let me flip back to the uh, Klausner and Ulrogi paper and their discussion around not simply the failures of corporate governance and potential conflicts or actual conflicts of interest, but how this might play out in the courts. Because we haven't seen uh, litigation go to a level where there's some real court cases that we can look to for precedent or other guidance. But uh, they suggest that one of the ways uh, SPACs might be able to avoid the conflict of interest is to have a non-interested board of directors uh, manage uh, the SPACs and actually make the decisions on which companies uh, to go uh, to take public and then uh, have that uh, disinterested board actually run that company. But that's really not what is being done. And are investors on notice that this is just an inside game or is there something else going on? Look, 2020 has proven to be the year of many things, and the same for 2022. But if you're a small business, this could also be the year you switch to a better payroll. Gusto wasn't just built for small businesses, it was built for the people behind them. Their online payroll is easy to use. Gusto can automatically calculate paychecks and file all your payroll taxes, which means you have more time to run your business. Plus, Gusto does way more than payroll. Gusto helps with time tracking, health insurance, 401ks, onboarding, commuter benefits, offer letters, access to HR experts. You get the idea. It's super easy to set up and get started. If you're moving from another provider, they can transfer all your data for you. It's no surprise that 94% of customers are likely to recommend Gusto. And here's the best part. Because you're a listener to this podcast, you get three months totally free. All you have to do is go to gusto.com backslash compliance. That's gusto.com backslash compliance. I'm telling you, you're going to love Gusto. Get started today. Well, again, because there are so many SPACs that are so new, this is all still largely uncharted waters. Now, most SPACs are incorporated in Delaware, so these disputes, when they eventually arise, which they are starting to, they're going to go to the Delaware Chancery Court. But the Chancery Court hasn't made any firm rulings on any of this yet about how to apply corporate law to the unique governance structures of a SPAC. Uh, there's only been one case so far that has even heard, the, seen the inside of a chancery courtroom yet. That only happened last month where defendants were trying to float a motion to dismiss. But if you are a SPAC sponsor and then you pad the board of directors with either your own executives or your cronies and henchmen, so you have a board that isn't really independent and you're paying them in, I don't know, equity in the SPAC well, then they have an economic incentive to always, always to say, oh, yeah, we should totally do this merger, shareholders. This is going to be great. Um, even if 
it's not great. And even if the shareholders are going to lose their shirt. Now, I'll give you one example of how bizarre this dispute could get in Chancery Court. So let's say that a dud merger goes through and the shareholders are outraged and they say, we're going to take you to court. Well, if they file derivative litigation against the board of the newly public company, it's going to have a whole new board of directors who are largely going to be from that target that got acquired. And so that board and that newly public company are just going to turn around and say, well, we had nothing to do with this. We weren't on the SPAC's board. We didn't recommend that you acquire us or not. That was the SPAC and the sponsor. Go sue them. So if you try to sue the SPAC sponsor and its old board directly, they would turn around and say, you can't sue us. We're not part of the business anymore. If you're a shareholder unhappy with the company, go sue the company. So you've got both sides pointing fingers at each other about who to sue, and the shareholders are sitting there with no recourse. That is a very plausible defense scenario that could arise that Klausner and Olrogi outline in their paper. And what are you going to do? Now, we don't know because the issue hasn't been decided by the Chancery Court yet, but there are various other schemes like that where SPAC sponsors, if they lack enough of a conscience, could say, We shouldn't have any extra level of judicial review. We're just like any other company, even though they're not. And then you wind up with shareholders who don't really have any practical resource or recourse to say that they got screwed over by an unscrupulous SPAC sponsor. Uh, So what are you going to do in that situation? And we're trying to figure that out while all of these SPACs are pouring into the SEC. They're pouring into the capital markets. They're all going to have to acquire a private company sooner or later because they all have 18 to 24 months to do it, or they have to give the money back to shareholders. And all of the sponsors' time and effort and resources to do that merger deal, if it comes to nothing, they lose all of that money. That's where their inherent conflict comes from. So we have a whole big mess Um, We don't know what the answers are going to be, and the clock is ticking for the sponsors to do a deal soon, and there's zillions of these firms out here now. They're all going to be looking for great private sector companies. They're not going to find enough, and that leads them to say, well, I'm just going to grab that private company over there. Yeah, sure, you. We're going to merge with you. Sound good? Great. Everybody's rich except for the shareholders. That's the kind of scenario that we could see in the next year to 18 months. And it's uh, it's not good. It's not good for shareholders. It's not good for investor protection. Uh, there's all sorts of ways this could lead to fraud allegations and all sorts of messiness. We have a recipe for a corporate governance mess here. And I think the, the cooking of that is well underway. Matt, we've touched upon the potential conflicts of interest. We've also touched upon Uh, poor corporate governance. But there's one other area that uh, I really thought a lot about and you touched upon in your blog post, which is internal controls. And typically in a private company, you have uh, either less robust internal controls, but you certainly do not have SOX 404 mandated internal controls because those are only mandated for U.S. public companies. But when a SPAC purchases a private company and then demergers, uh, the SPAC, so that the private company becomes the U.S. public company, on day one, they uh, legally are obligated to have SOX 404 controls in place. And with the shortened time frame of many of these SPACs to move to demerger, uh, I see a lot of problems about getting your internal controls scaled up literally immediately uh, to move forward in the public reporting sphere. Uh, I think that is a very valid concern. It is a concern that the SEC has uh, expressed in guidance over the past year about SPACs and their deals to clarify that once you are a publicly traded company, you are a publicly traded company. You have to think about these things. They have to be up and running. As you said, we have already seen some of these deals start to go sideways. Uh, One of them is Lordstown Motors, the electric trucking vehicle startup that went public via SPAC is now under investigation for accounting fraud, which happens when you have weak internal controls. uh, And they've already admitted as much that they're under investigation by the Securities Exchange Commission. They're under investigation by the Justice Department. Several senior executives have already been sent packing. It is that kind of a mess that emerges post-merger because 
either the target didn't have effective internal controls in place or the SPAC acquiring them either didn't care or didn't do enough exercise of due diligence to make sure those controls were in place. And why would the SPAC? Because the clock is ticking for them. They have to do a deal quickly. And the mergers that they do are typically, they can happen in three or four months compared to a traditional IPO, which might take you, you know, if you're lucky, you'll get it done in nine months. It's probably going to take more than a year where big law firms and the big four audit firms, they're going to crawl all over your operation to make sure that your disclosure controls and your ICFR are proper and in place. And none of that happens in a SPAC. It all can get very loosey-goosey. I am, I am sure we will see other cases like the Lordstown Motor investigations are going to come to light. Uh, we've already seen a separate one that happened pre-merger where the SEC took an enforcement action against a SPAC that failed to disclose it was acquiring a satellite technology company that didn't actually do any tests of its technologies up in the air, which didn't work, failed to disclose that the executive of the target was considered a national security interest by the United States because he was a Russian national. Like All sorts of wacky stuff can happen in these deals, and I think we're only going to see more of them. And we don't have any good answers yet about what is the law that would protect shareholders uh, when you have such inherent conflicts in the SPAC structure. So, Matt, the um, uh, other thing that really, uh, well, I was going to say the other example uh, that didn't happen in terms of an enforcement or investigation was Bill Ackerman, who was going to do an incredibly complicated SPAC, uh, took it to the SEC for some sort of pre-approval blessing, which the SEC did not uh, give him, and then the shareholders voted down uh, the potential uh, acquisition leading to the potential uh, merger and going public. So uh, it seems like uh, there are lots of issues at the regulatory stage. At this point, uh, do we have any hint when the uh, SEC might give us some regulatory guidance? Well, they've published several letters uh, in more, they're not formal rules yet. Uh, but they have published several utterances about SPACs throughout the course of 2021. Uh, we do know that SPACs and the need for more formal guidance is on the radar of the SEC rulemaking division, the Division of Corporation Finance. Uh, they haven't specifically said that they're going to put out these proposals on this date yet. I don't think we would see any extra guidance or formal rulemaking until 2022, uh, but it is worth noting that one person thanked in the footnotes by Michael Klausner and Michael Olrogi is a man named John Coates. And if that name rings a bell to anybody, he was the general counsel of the SEC from the start of the Biden administration up until October, before he then went back to Harvard Law School, where he does all of his big thinking about corporate law issues. And he's a very good thinker about this. But uh, they ha if they were relying on John uh, on uh, John Coates to give them some guidance about writing this paper and to give some feedback and whatnot, look, if John Coates has already seen this paper, then I guarantee that others still at the Division of Corporation Finance, they've seen this paper too. They're thinking about these issues. I am certain we will see more from the SEC. And especially if the Chancery Court makes what I think would be bad decisions and leaves SPAC shareholders without much investor protection in the Delaware court realm, then I think we'll see the SEC step in with more formal guidance to protect investors uh, at the federal securities level. I don't know what that might look like. I don't know when we're going to see it, but I, it seems to me that that's destined to happen at some point. Um, and the the data we're seeing from CalcBench, the issues being raised by um, Klausner and Olrogi, they just all point to the fact that SPACs are a very rickety sort of contraption in the public markets at the moment. They need more attention, and I think we're going to see it. Well, Matt, it does seem like to me this will be one area that we'll be visiting again into 2022 and perhaps beyond. I think so too, Tom. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance into the Weeds. 
I'm going to link to Matt's blog post in our show notes, so check that out for additional information. I'd also like to tell you about the latest addition to the Compliance Podcast Network, Design Thinking in Compliance, where with my co-host Karsten Tams, we take a look at the social engineering tool of design thinking and how it can create greater efficiency and effectiveness in your compliance program. So check out Design Thinking in Compliance. It posts every other Wednesday. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.